transferable wealth is not the same thing as legacy wealth. I mean, yes, I want to pass things down to my kids and grandkids, don't get me wrong, but I want it to be so much bigger than that. I want to transfer to the world. I want to transfer to as many people as possible. Wealth is when we have transferable wealth, right? When I have wealth that is embodied in me and I take time to come and share that with someone, to mentor somebody, to pour into somebody, now I've transferred my experiences, my expertise, all of it. Now I've transferred it over. So quite frankly, I really don't care about legacy wealth. <laughs>
as you know, listener, as you're listening to this, I want to encourage you to think like, this isn't just Julie and this just isn't, it's not any other guest. It's, this is also potential your story because you have a uniqueness to you. You are pre-qualified, the only person pre-qualified to be you. And so I have had this belief for a very, very, probably in it my entire life. I've always had a very strong faith and that faith has allowed me to lean into a lot of risks that would otherwise make people feel very, very uncomfortable. Um, when I was in college, mm. I was actually a business major and I was going to start my own women's rock climbing clothing company, which I don't share this often, but it goes along with everything really well. <laughs> I love that. Um, back in that time, totally dating myself, there wasn't any clothing available for women rock climbers. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I happened to yeah. live in the same community as Royal Robbins, who um, had his own clothing apparel. You can get it still at REI. He has 511 Tactical. I mean, he has since passed away. The company has been sold and all of that. However, I had the opportunity to go there and to actually work there. And I could see where I could potentially go with this. And meanwhile, I'm driving on my lunch hour back home in these college days of working at, at this, you know, for this company. And I'm like, very clearly, you need to become a teacher. <laughs> what the heck? Mm. <laughs> what do you mean I need to become a teacher? <laughs> Hard pivot. Yeah. <laughs> this is not part of the plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was so clear. And um, my faith in Christ has always been very, very strong. That's just a, that's a gift that I've been given. And I just knew I needed to do this. <laughs> and I went home mm. and I dropped, I didn't even think twice. I dropped all of my business classes. I did not know if I was going to get into the classes wow. I needed. And I was at a pivotal point in my college career to make that transition. And so I share that story to say that when we understand where we're supposed to go, we can pivot hard and we can head west and we can change our, orient our orientation really rapidly. And it looks to the world around us. And trust me, to a lot of people in my life, multiple times, people are like, mm -hmm. what are you doing? And it's like, um, <laughs> yeah. So I live in North Idaho, one stoplight town on the Canadian border for the last eight years. I don't know. How did I get here? Uh, God, that's the only explanation. <laughs> I just said, um, okay, <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. So when we live in that capacity, that, that, um, space where we can just have that faith and trust opportunities open. And so, yeah, I did start out as mm. a public school educator and I bought my first house because my dad, I'm third gen in real estate. I was raised in it, but nobody was like investor oriented. Nobody was in commercial real estate. And my dad's like, mm. you need to get into the market. You got to ride that equity elevator up. You got to, got to, got to. And, and it was fiercely competitive in California in the early 2000s. And, you know, we figured it out. We got into a house and that yeah. house became the first investment. That house became um, our first long distance. Uh, we actually had a property manager. We moved to Denver and we're like, okay, well, we're going to just trust this process. Uh, and, and through some other really <laughs> harsh experiences I had in my early adulthood, prior to my amazing husband, um, we, we developed a heart to serve people. My husband and I, well, I already had that heart. And when my husband and I started dating, that was part of our passion project was we want to create housing for people who, um, need to have a landing, a landing pad. Um, I had an abusive situation mm. in my life, unfortunately, but God repurposed that for so much good. And so my husband and I had this grand plan. We'll just live in these modest houses and we'll just simply, um, you know, live a humble lifestyle. And by the time we retire, we'll have a little, you know, cash of, poor, you know, single family homes. And that will help us out during those yeah. years. Well, fast forward quite a bit. We start doing this, by the way, we sold that first investment property, the home that we bought for, that I bought for a roof over my head <laughs> that ended up being our yeah. first home that turns out, you know, our first investment, we end up investing in our family. So sometimes investors want to hold on to things so tightly, but we actually have mm -hmm. the opportunity to say, maybe we want Julie to stay home with our kids. Maybe we want this other opportunity in our life. And so instead of hanging on to 
and there are lots of different ways we could have done things knowing what we know now, but we didn't know everything we know now because that was, you know, 16 years ago. So <laughs> we sell off this single family house and that has completely changed our life ever since then because it provided the opportunity for me to stay home with our kids. We had zero debt. We were able to just live in this whole different space as we were building our life together um, and developing a family. So we end up having a couple more, you know, single families, did the long distance landlord, but self-managed. Um, Cause I'm like, I can, mm-hmm. I can do that. I, I don't want to share with someone else. And I did, I was effective at it and I did it for years and never, ever once had any problems. So if you're listening and you want to do that, reach out to me. Cause if you're proactive, it doesn't take much and you can definitely help people. Um, but what happened after my daughter was born and we moved to North Idaho, I'm thinking there has to be another way. There has to be a better way because I feel vulnerable and I feel uncomfortable. I feel that this one-to-one ratio, we have reserves, but if someone were to move out and they destroyed the property and we needed to use all those reserves, I just went down the what if cycle, which I don't, Mm -hmm. that's not always a good place to go. I I generally stay away from what ifs. Yeah. But in that process, um, I looked at my husband, I'm like, honey, there's gotta be a better investment strategy. And he knows I'm ambitious. And he said, you know, do some research. He's open, do some research. See if you find something in, we both agreed real estate, in real estate that you'd like to do differently. And I went down this massive, like just full throttle. I'm going to learn and I'm going to grow. And I have a faith testimony and a real estate testimony. And I was driving to the gym one morning because I had a strong morning routine and all of a sudden I hear Monique Calm come on the podcast, Bigger Pockets, the very first woman I hear, and she talks about house hacking, which I actually did with that first house when I was living alone. She talks about all these nice. experiences. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love real estate. I love educating people. I love every bit of this. And all I wanted to do was go and support investors in you know, placing passive investments. So a lot of people will say, I don't know what I'm gonna do in you know in the real estate space in the syndication space what's my role and i knew from day one this is the role this is my lane this is my zone this is what i am pre-qualified with my dna god gave me to do and never once turned back i love that (laughs) i i want to i want to back up because you said something that uh and, and you said it uh pretty like we moved past it pretty quickly, but I thought it was so profound that uh, you had said, um, you know, you were sort of re-asking yourself, how'd I get here? And you're like, I don't know. I just kept saying, okay. And I think about all, of, you know, if you've, if you've ever read Matt McConaughey's book, Green Lights, he talks about this as well, of, is, um, you know, in life, God will, God will open doors for you, turn on green lights, whatever the case may be. But if we have this open hand mentality and say, all right, Lord, whatever, whatever you want to take, take away, whatever you want to give, give to me, my hands are open for it. I just keep saying, okay. And I end up in a perfect place like this. And it's so funny how, because when I, before, we had, you and I have met a couple months back at a conference and, and, uh, and when I was doing research today, I was like, elementary teacher to realtor, to syndicator and pot, how, like, how does this get here? <laughs> makes perfect sense when you know that there's a, a faith story behind it and you just are the willing party that says, okay, I don't know what that means. I don't know how to get there. I don't know how I would have taken myself there, but I'll follow. And I think that's a, such a profound lesson to learn for people, especially who have a faith background, but just roll with the punches, follow the signs and keep saying, okay. You know, it's, it's so. I, I was going to say, Julie, in, in the sense of, uh, in taking what J- uh, Jake is talking about, we're on, I, I view it, we're on God's journey. We, he's going to take us where we go. And so I see so many people kind of stay at the starting line of the journey, trying to figure everything out. And uh, that's part of head West. Just take that first step and go and, and be faithful of what God's going to do. And you're going to go left, right up and down. And, and it sounds like how you ended up in Idaho has 
that same tone to it right (laughs) it does okay so a a couple of thoughts because um we all know i we all love we all love god we all love Mm -hmm. jesus and 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 i'm sure you guys love just being you know in the word reading your bibles and and i'm in the process of preparing to have my second massive event and i'm doing it alone and it is terrifying and maybe at the beginning of December, I was actually having some sleepless nights Mm. and I do not like losing sleep. Okay. I don't have any young children in my life anymore. There is no reason I should not be sleeping at night. Okay. (laughs) So I was losing sleep and wrestling because there's so much exposure, so much vulnerability when you're putting on a big event. And it's like, you want to serve your sponsors, your speakers, and your attendees. You want everybody to be winning so powerfully. Right. And it was keeping me up at night and, and I'd wake up and just dive into my Bible in the morning because I could tell that it was something deeper. I could mm-hmm. tell that there was a deeper undertone. And so these, I call them like midnight conversations with God. They're more like two in the morning, actually, but <laughs> it sounds better midnight. Um, and so I'm, I'm having these conversations with God saying like, I, I don't understand because I I have faith. I believe that this is where you want me. And I always say, if I'm where God wants me, if I'm vertically aligned, I don't have to worry about anything else. Like Mm -hmm. I, I just have to be willing. And I'm like, gosh, Lord, you know, I'm willing to do this. And this goes with the things in my life and why I've iterated so many times, you know, I'm willing, what is going on? You know, I have faith. And then I learned, I've been learning this difference between faith and trust. Mm. And it's a big gap between so true. Can you unpack that a little bit? Trust is when we're actually putting action to our faith. It means I am moving forward. I believe you so much so that I am actually going to do something about it. Mm. I'm actually going to uproot my family and, and move away from my mom. Who's now a widow which sounds crazy to me because I know what you say about widows and children. What the heck, God? But I'm going to have faith, not just faith, but I'm going to trust that you have my best interest in heart and you have a perfect plan, Mm -hmm. right? I wouldn't know about syndication, actually, if God, I don't think I would have, if God didn't move my family where he did. I wouldn't have a podcast if God didn't move my family where he did. I would not have the reach in, in influence, and it's very minor, but I wouldn't be able to impact lives the way I am. And it's a small way compared to others, but I never thought I'd be doing something like this. And God says really clearly. So one of the verses that God gave me every morning, I'd wake up after our midnight conversations and, you know, dig into my Bible and God would give me something because God's kind. I'm obsessed with how kind God is. And he's like, here you go. And there's this verse in Psalms because you go to Psalms when you're having a hard time, right? Mm. And in, in Psalms, it says, I alone. And it, and that was a part that kept standing out to me and I'd have to go to my journal to, because I write out the verses that stand out to me, but it just stood out to me is that so many times we think we are in control and that we want to be in control. I'm a recovering mm, control freak, by yeah. the way. And so but God says, I alone am doing this. So we, we don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about how it's going to happen. I can take action if I have the faith that that I am where I'm supposed to be and I trust God, which means I take action. I know God alone is the one that is in control of all things. And if we put a little cherry on top, going back to, I don't want to have a, um, I don't want to have a Jonah moment, right? (laughs) Who wants a Jonah moment for you? (laughs) Okay. We don't want to be stuck in the belly of the whale because we were, you know, just like not going to be in obedience with God's plan. Right. So I don't want a Jonah moment. I also don't want a Red Sea moment. Bless Moses's heart. But I don't want the army uh, and I don't want to be here's the army. Here's the river. I don't want to be in that position. Yeah. So I have settled in this this sweet spot recently of like, I just want to be like Joshua crossing the Jordan with the Israelites. Because God held the spring water flow of that river. God actually held it back. Mm -hmm. He didn't part it in the same way that he did the Red Sea. He held it back. And then in the middle of the river on dry ground had every single tribe stack a rock Mm -hmm. so that it could be seen for generations to come and tell the story of God. 
But what's profound is they camped there in the middle of the night on dry ground. We're talking millions of people. They didn't, or over a million people at least, right? And they, where, where is our level of trust? Like I told you guys off air, I used to be a checklist Christian. And when we live that checklist Christian life, we don't live an empowered life mm. that's full of the adventure and God moments. And so everything that I have done over the years has really led into that where it's like, okay, cool. Um, I don't know how you're going to hold this water back, but I trust mm. that you're going to hold this water back and I'm going to put my feet in this quickly flowing river and I'm going to trust it's not, I'm not being an idiot. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I'm not just like, okay, God, God's I think that you some, want me to win the intelligence. Yeah. I, I'm going to go buy a bunch of lottery tickets because I know you want me to be wealthy. I'm not saying being <laughs> dumb like that, like know where God's calling you to, but that's where opportunity lies. Yeah. Where do, where do you feel the, uh, this is a great lead into the question I was kind of kicking around while you were talking is for you, where, where does the line lie where, so going back to the Bible, there's a story, um, where, uh, the water parted and they crossed. There's another story where the water parted when they dipped their toe in the water. Some took action, some took waiting. Where's the line for you on these things where if you're, if you're constantly living in a state of just saying, okay, Lord, I see the direction you're going. Where's the green light, red light for you of, I need to wait for God to move or I need to go. I think God makes it really, really clear, right? So when he parted the water, Moses had to put his staff up in the air. Yeah. And that was a very different, different element versus like, okay, the priest going in first and having to actually be in the water mm -hmm. before anything happened. When I, when God moved my family to North Idaho, I actually blogged my way through it. At some point I may have a book for, I mean, it, it, it should be a book at some point, right? But the concept behind it, and the reason I mentioned that is because it's called right now, the working title from years ago is uh, writing in the wait, because that entire move was a story of waiting and waiting and waiting and being comfortable in the waiting. And so it's almost like that hot potato. It's like being open and saying, okay, am I doing what you have asked me to do? God knows and honors that we have willing hearts. So he knows that we're willing to do what we need to do. And sometimes we just have to simply wait because God wants to, to stretch us so that our trust, our, our faith, sorry, not our trust, but our faith is grown. And so when we moved to North Idaho, our house, you know, we were closing on two different, three different houses were closing. And it was just, it was a crazy, it was such a crazy situation. Um, my mother-in-law ended, ended up having to have a, a surgery right as we're literally having to having to drive away and she's in the hospital right like there were so many tests that said like um do you trust me do you mm. trust what i'm up to <laughs> and the same thing happens in our investing right we have to say like hmm do we trust god with our investing or are we going to trust the news and what the news is saying about the market cycle and the fear that they want to inject into us or are we going to have faith and say um, I don't need to explain why this works. I need to know that the numbers work. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I need to know that all of that works and that the mechanics of the business plan are intact, but I don't have to freak out and not move forward because I'm scared the sky is going to fall. Mm -hmm. I don't need to sideline any part of my life out of fear or complacency. And I will, I'll add one more thing. Apparently I'm adding extras <laughs> after everything I say, I apologize, <laughs> but, um, it, it, there was actually a deal. I launched it to my investors and I had actually been down in Texas. So North Idaho to Texas, opposite ends of the country. Yeah. And I'm down there. My kids are with me, you know, we're a whole family walked the whole th investment. Like this is beautiful. This is going to be great. This is what my investors are looking for. I like the team. I like everything about this. The numbers are solid. The financing is solid. Like it passed all of my check boxes, but we already, I already said, I don't like not sleeping. And I had three sleepless nights hmm. and I couldn't explain it. But every time I went back in those midnight conversations, it just kept going back to just not being at peace with 
with this deal. I'm like, wait, that's so weird. I was at total peace with it. And I launched this out to my investors. And yet <laughs> um, I'm going to withdraw. This is crazy. I could get on the blacklist. Like mm. these are investors that I respect and admire and I want to partner with and I'm going to withdraw. How's that going to work for my reputation? Sure. I mean, all of the questions. Yeah. But I withdrew from it. I called the investors that were already interested and I said, hey, I can't put my finger on it, but I'm going to trust. Um, and they know I'm a person of faith, but I'm like, I'm, I'm going to trust this intuition that I am being given. Like everything looks good. You are welcome to invest in this if you want to. I, yeah. And they said, no, we're going to follow you. You know, like if, if you're not going to be in it, we, you know, we want to go where you go. I'm like, okay. A month later, the whole thing fell apart. Wow. And I could not, I think that was also God's kindness because sure. usually we don't get to see the outcome of things mm -hmm. or it's years yeah. later. So the fact that it was a month, month and a half later, I thought, well, that was, that was really kind that I, I acted, I listened and I took action on that, but there's always waiting. Mm. Waiting is not bad. Yeah. We're just impatient Americans. <laughs> <laughs> it, Julie, you, uh, you, you've had places where God has told you to wait. And uh, I can tell, I was on an opposite side of a thing back in my earlier business days where um, we bought a competitor. This is when, when I was in my manufacturing distribution business. And the numbers look good. They look like, oh, this is a sweet deal, sweet deal. And uh, I couldn't sleep at night. And I'd wake up the next morning and, oh, we're going to do the deal. We're going to do the deal. This went on for three months. We ended up doing the deal. I mean, this was up and down, ended up doing the deal. And I remember the feeling and the conviction God was giving me to not buy this manufacturing company. I bought it. This is back in the early days, back in uh, the beginning of some of the manufacturing side. And uh, while you look at the numbers, while you th think these numbers are going to come through and everything is going to be great, uh, we ended up buying the business, moving management to our company, uh, to our office in Fremont, Nebraska. A year later, I fired all the people that came with. I almost, I lost, won't say the number, but it was the worst and the best for me, because I can tell when God's talking to me mm. and that, that feeling of, uh, I get, the, I don't, I don't care what it is, what's happening, going out to the mailbox, the conviction of don't go to the mailbox. You know, you yeah, know what I'm sure. talking about? Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, I think in life, um, you have those experiences where you're not listening and God uses that for good. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I found that out earlier in life than uh, than than uh, later in life. So your 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 story about the 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 property in Dallas, something didn't feel right. You weren't sleeping, and that's uh, God's discernment and your discernment listening to God on that. That's mm -hmm. that's a great story. Yeah, great story. That concept of, of, of discernment or, uh, you know, gut instinct or intuition and such, right? It's something that I have realized that most people don't train themselves mm. to listen to. Yeah. Just like most people don't teach themselves how to think. I like John C. Mm -hmm. Maxwell's book on um, thinking for a change or... I don't know. It's back behind yeah. me. You know, it's a great, it's a great book. Cause you realize like people are lazy and they don't actually teach themselves how to flex the muscle and think. Hmm. And it's the same thing with intuition and particularly in, in Western culture, it's really frowned upon. Yeah. So you have like these two extremes. You're either this zealous religious fanatic person and <laughs> like, Oh, you're just like all woo. And you're just like <laughs> living off this. Or you're this sterile person. And instead of saying, actually, again, I'm pre-qualified, I'm created in the image of God and uh, he has empowered me 
Like I have the Holy Spirit in me. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I should tap into that. That's pretty resourceful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you have to train yourself how to listen to it. Yeah. You have to train yourself with, oh, that's not just me. That's not just a voice in my head or that's not just a feeling. Like you have to teach yourself how to discern the yeah. difference between this is me, this is my pride, this is my ego. Um, I learned that with through an e-commerce experience that was miserable, but it was the best experience ever because I had 126,000 leveraged on an American Express card when Walmart shut my store down and they shut half of their stores down, like all of wow. these, you know, third party mm -hmm. e-com places. And it was terrifying. I was thinking, what kind of position have I put my family in? I've compromised everything. Like, this is terrible. This is horrible. And, um, it felt so vulnerable in that, in that moment. And then God was so faithful. And my husband was, he was just kind of going along. I wanted multiple streams of passive income. And he's like, he had red flags that he saw. So he and I both learned different lessons mm. from this. And, and, you know, I'm like, no, but X, Y, Z, these people are doing it. La la la. I, I honestly, it was FOMO that was really driving everything. I'm like, dude, all my friends are doing this and they're making money and I don't want to be the one not making money. Like sign me up. And, and so I, and it's passive income, which is our goal. So I go down this path when you have that much leveraged on an Amex card, right? You have these payments and when you have it, $80,000 payment coming due, like, oh, that's not fun. <laughs> and it's so cool because Walmart could have held all of my, all of my money because all of the money was tied up in the store and um, they could have held it. But every single time there was a payment due and I'd be losing sleep, losing sleep, probably six months were absolutely miserable. And, um, and then right when I needed it, because that's how God is. God is on time. Mm -hmm. He's on an on, on time. On his God. time, yeah. He, he's, <laughs> and, and it's like it's always perfect yeah. timing. And so I'd get, the, I'd get like a, you know, distribution uh, that was my money. Made me mad they were holding it, but I would get part of my money, and it would be enough to make the payment that was necessary. Mm. Talk about building yeah. trust, you guys. Talk yeah. about or talk about building faith. And yeah. so when we think about it, it's like I learned to trust my husband or to, you know, to, to have more confidence. I have confidence in my husband that comes out wrong. Um, but to listen to him more and his input and his guidance and his intuition. Mm -hmm. So we have to listen to our spouse's intuition on things. If, if so we are true. Married. Yeah. And his, his intuition was like, no, 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 no. And I'm like overriding it. And so often we override that intuition with what we want. And so just hmm. simply learning how, how to listen through that, that was a painful experience. And this is also why I'm sold out on real estate. I'm like, never deviate again. Never. I will never deviate from my real estate path. <laughs> I, it's uh, even like both of your stories sound like expensive lessons, but valuable <laughs> lessons. Right. And I, I think people think that a gut instinct is just, you have it or you don't. Like there's, it's, it's black or white. And, and to your point, I think that it's, it's more of a, a muscle that is strengthened over time. Everybody has the ability to, to strengthen their gut instinct and gut instinct is simply just experience that is, that has been learned over time, but it's been continuously tested. And, and I think it was almost like a, a an old radio dial. Like you turn it right and you kind of tune it in Oh, a little too far and go back to left a little bit more and you tune it in to where I've done enough where I've dialed this baby in that if I, if I hear this thing, I know something's up and that's something that I've learned from bad things. I've learned from good things, but I reflect over the decisions I made and how I felt in the moment in order to dial that, that thing in. One of the things we use uh, in our family is our spiritual antennas. Are your in spiritual antennas up? Yeah. Are they getting bigger? You know, and I, and I use the, the, the visual of a moose up in Idaho. You guys got elk, <laughs> yes, these <we> big <laughs> antlers, these antennas. Is your spiritual antenna up? Because things will be coming in front of you. God will put things in front of whatever. There's so much going on. Are your antennas up to take and appreciate what God's putting in front of you? Mm, yep. And if you're so concentrated on the, this little this going on, you're going to miss blessings that go by. Mm. And it's critical. One of, our, one of my partners, and uh, Jake knows him, and he has a saying that 
money buys you experience. And experience makes you money. Mm -hmm. The point being, we all start businesses. We all do things. We all think we have. And and if you look at anybody in in the business world that's heading the right direction, everything didn't work. Everything didn't work out. And and now you got me on a a soapbox. So Jake, (laughs) rein me in here. One of my great (laughs) business mentors, um, my first job, he would love to hire people that failed. Mm. Yep. Mm. They wanted to hear the failed story. How did you get up? How did you pick yourself up? What did you learn from that? That was more important than everybody that won, 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 and they don't know how to fail. And because in life, life's not easy. We're all doing life and things change all the time. And so I always think about that is that we're all going to have times and issues where we fail um, and how we pick ourselves up. And it could be expensive, but you've got to pick yourself up and get going again. Mm-hmm. Get back on God's journey. Yeah. You know, the, to, the, to that point, I'm thinking of like, I told you guys I always have books around me, but a couple of books I've read recently is like, Donald Miller and Business Made Simple and Trip Lanier in this book will make you dangerous. Mm-hmm. Both of these books, two completely very different authors, yeah. right? Different worldviews and things like that. And in both of those books, they both point to the only pe- the people who are successful have more fails on their track record. <laughs> And so if you so want true. to be yeah. successful, you have to be willing to face plan. And so I think when we're, you know, that classic analogy, when we're kids and we're, we go from being a little baby into crawling, into walking, into running, all mm-hmm. of that, like we're tripping, falling, like you look at any one and a half year old, they're the most one and a half to two and a half, like they're the most bruised up, like what <laughs> happened over their scar face, yeah. right? And so because they're, they're doing it and and they're putting action out there and their failures and every single human being walking around, which is everybody who's able, right? I mean, we've all gone through that process and somehow we forget that process and we stop creating. And for those of us who, you know, believe in, in have faith in God, right? We get to co-create with God. How freaking awesome is that? that. (laughs) Hi, (laughs) sign me up. Let's co-create together. And I'm going to trip and fall and stumble along the way, but that is going to be a okay. Yeah. So let's do that. I love that. Chase the lion. Yeah. I love that, that mentality. Um, you can either be, you can either be a willing participant or a willing bystander and you can be used in the story of what God wants to do. And it's gonna be freaking fun and and scary at times but uh you're gonna end up in a destination that's far better than any destination you could chosen yourself or you can stand by and watch as he uses other people to do the things he wants to do and uh, it's really it's really your choice if you're if you're uh if you're the captain of an ocean liner and you're off course how do you get back on course You got to turn left yeah. or right, but you can only make correction if you're moving. Mm. Mm. If the ship is not going and moving, if you're not heading west, if you're not taking that next step, if you're not doing the things to head down that journey for Christ, you can't make a change. You can't move. You can't steer a, a ship that's not moving. So you've kind of like, you got to get moving. You got to go on, take that next step. Yeah. And that visualization, that little child that's learning how to walk, takes a couple of steps and boom, goes down, gets back up again, just keeps on going. So true. So, so imperative. And, and in that process, right? Um, as, as we're stumbling along, we learn the lessons. <laughs> and a lot of times we can, um, I, I, these are, we've touched on so many concepts. I'm clear. I'm, very much obsessed with and talk about on the conscious investor. It's like, but that concept of um, sometimes we forget that because we're pre-qualified, we've been handed the script of our life. Like, here you go. And we forget to be the starring member of our life and to actually be that person. And we subordinate our calling and our vision and our 
everything that we feel drawn to, we subordinate that into the scripts of other people's lives around mm -hmm. us. And now we start playing like extras in everybody else's lives instead of actually leading our life. So we start thinking about that momentum, that movement we're trying to create. If we're constantly being depleted and stretched into these other people's narratives, which obviously there's there's like overlap yeah. in everybody's narratives. We're, we're created for community, right? However, we also have that responsibility and obligation to say, what is my contribution? What is, what am I created for? What is my role here? And am I, am I living as a living offering to God or am I offering the best of me to all of these other people? And now um, I'm spread so thin that I can't even <clears throat> do what I'm actually, that I've been pre-qualified mm -hmm. to do. So true. I would love, I want to, God, there's so many places we can go with this. I want to go back to something you said that was so, um, so profound and, uh, I don't give any, you don't have to give any details, but you had said about you, you had a uh, traumatic event as a child and, and, uh, you had this, uh, decision of repurposing your pain, so to speak, right? Okay. Don't share any details there, but what do you think it's something innate in you that allowed you to take your pain and repurpose it for the good of others? Or do you think everybody's got that same capability? What allows you to do that despite, you know, the pain that came from that situation? Yeah. And I, I appreciate that. Yes. I I'm going to just do a little, little brief overview is like growing up with faith, growing up in a bubble world, and then finding yourself in early adulthood in an abusive situation is not where you want to line up. Yeah. And, um, and it was really, really rough and it could have been a, um, I mean, like, honestly, it should have completely destroyed me. I was suicidal at a, I was suicidal at a point and such. And I also had a great veneer. I like showed up to work, had the smile, had the everything like, here we go. Right. We're good. And I, a lot of people are walking around like that. Now, anytime you see, you, I wear everything on my face. Like, you know, mm -hmm. if I, you know what mood <laughs> I'm in, it's right here. Like there is no veneer. If I'm smiling, I'm smiling. Yeah. If I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> but, but um, in that process, we just get to decide and, and God and I had it out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I was crying, driving down the freeway, just sobbing and angry i'd never been angry with god before and i was angry and i'm like i did everything right i checked every box i did what you asked i did what was right and that was a really the first taste that i ever had of how how broken the world is and that we're not going to experience heaven here on earth and this world is broken mm -hmm. god is good and he took all of those pieces we had it out and i just said listen here are the here are the decisions i'm making god i'm going to choose to live i'm going to choose to leave this this situation altogether which is not it was a divorce situation which is so controversial the first person in my family line everything like that it was just this whole very challenging decision and it was like okay here's the deal god i might not ever be able to serve you in some capacity through the church setting or whatever maybe i've tarnished myself because i'm gonna have this big d against my my resume or something um i don't care i'm gonna choose life and i'm going to choose to follow you and that's those are gonna be my choices mm -hmm. and i'm not gonna worry about what anybody else thinks i'm not going to worry about what my family thinks i'm not going to worry about what the church thinks i'm not going to worry about what anybody else thinks this is you and me and i choose you but these are my terms and conditions basically <laughs> like i'm leaving this situation <laughs> and 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 i i said i know that you're big enough and that you have forgiveness but i i'm broken i can't mm. do this anymore and i believe i'm supposed to live <laughs> and so i'm like and i it was just that tremendous amount of wrestling um and i think that that's good 
I mean, Jacob wrestled with God. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. we all, I think we have our moments. Like I identify very much with Peter. I feel like he and I are going to like hang out a lot in heaven. You know, it's like, <laughs> He's very relatable. You're, you're just, we, oh my gosh, so <laughs> relatable. And so, you know, you just think about those elements. Um, for me, watching God rebuild my life. And, and it was a trust. And I believe it's for all people. I don't think that that was like unique to me. Yeah. Like God never intends us to be destroyed in things. God is not a destroyer. God is a God of second, third, fourth, fifth, like millions of chances. Like provide you, you want it. You're willing. Awesome. Um, a pastor at, at my church recently taught on how God is so, um, he calls it front facing. And he admitted, he's like, I got this analogy from someone else, but it's like, he had two chairs sitting in front of each other. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, just picture, you know, you're at a table, there's no table between you, but you're, you're sitting, looking at each other, your chairs are looking at each other. And sometimes we turn our chair against away from God, instead of heading West, we start heading East. (laughs) So, (laughs) but God is kind and God is good. And he, he literally moves and goes right back in front of us. He's like, wherever you are, I want this relationship with you. I want to have, I want to be part of your life. I want to co-create with you. I want to help you. I want to direct your life. And when we're willing to simply release our pride and release our control and say like, well, I don't have to do this on my own. So I would, I, I end up moving back in with my parents while I'm getting my feet back on the ground. And I would picture myself because every day something, my, all, all of my bank accounts were frozen. Oh, I didn't even realize this person hadn't even been paying taxes. Like, oh, <laughs> that sucks for me. <laughs> like, I mean, it became laughable and this is during desert storm. Wow. And mm. so we, I just started like just making all these comments, like this is operation, whatever, you know, I'm like, and I'd go to sleep at night and I'd picture myself like God's hand. And I'd visualize myself curled up in God's hand. Mm. And I'm like, you mm. have me. Cause God says over and over that like, he's got us. We're held in his hands. We're okay. And that was the only way I could go to sleep, but I could go to sleep. So God rebuilds wow. our life when we are willing. And when we, when we just tr- have that, it is trust. Like it's faith and trust mixed together. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm not going to go try to rebuild this my way. I am going to have faith that you have a purpose in all of this. Like you didn't plan this. You didn't, you don't want these bad things happening, but man, I prayed over and over for years and I still do. And I, it was a deliberate prayer. Whatever I've had to suffer and go through, please repurpose this Mm -hmm. for your, for, for my good and for your glory. Amen. And God is faithful. I asked that because I, I, you know, it's, um, the, a lot of people would just take it and bury it and then not use it or repurpose it or let others benefit from it. And, uh, I'm sure I've screwed that up a number of times where God's like, Oh, that could, you know, that could have been really helpful for somebody. But I always come back to this. I, this, I won't go to the long, I'll give you the short version of it. But, uh, as a kid, I wasn't, I wasn't included in a lot of activities like, you know, middle school. Like I was always the kid who had to like work his way into the in crowd in order to be invited to things. And so I just became in that hurt and that pain. I just became the kid who always, uh, set up events. I set up the parties. I started the, the clubs and I started the teams and that way I was always by default included in. And it was a really painful time of, you know, of my life and flash forward to my, my mid twenties. Uh, I was working part-time at my local church and, uh, I was the outreach coordinator. And, uh, I can't remember what we were doing, but, uh, something was going on. I wasn't feeling great about, about my role in, in the church. Um, and I remember like all of a sudden the Lord reminded me of, of all that pain of being left out, built the muscle to be an event coordinator and to invite people and to bring people in that's now being used for the benefit of everybody else at the church. Cause now I'm an event coordinator and I'm setting up events where everybody can, can be part of it. And I just think about the Lord's ability to, to reshape and repurpose good, bad, or indifferent for the benefit of yourself, but the benefit of others as well. If we're willing, like you said, just say, okay, all right, Lord, this is, uh, I, I, this is your story. Really. I'm just the, I'm just the lead uh, actor or actress in it. Uh, <laughs> but that takes a, 
that's a, that's a tough decision to make, and it really takes some some thoughtfulness to to make that decision. We have to be okay with the pain. Yeah, we have to be okay that it can hurt, but we can still make we can still make good choices. Julie, you were like we have to. We don't have to deny any of the the pain or the heartache or anything, and to know that Christ went through that. Disciples went through that. Christians across the globe have gone through that over the over all the centuries, right? And so it's like that's so that's oh, and to have like a okay, like it's it's okay that I feel this way, and it's it's okay that I can still take action, mm -hmm. and it's okay that it's a takes time to heal. Sometimes it's a quick heal, and sometimes it takes time. Yeah. You see, you see so often in life and is you were talking about earlier, Julie, about people going through life. And I'll, I'll use my analogy that people have this facade on They're They're walking through the life, whether it's business or um, anything that you're doing, that they have this facade. And one of the coolest things that I've seen, and you probably seen the same thing when you're working with your investors and things like that is that when people actually get real, the facade goes away and you start talking and investing and leaning into their life and then the walls come down. I've seen just magical things happen for Christ. If people put the facade down, come as you are and take that step. Mm -hmm. how, how have you, you said you're investing in people. How have you seen that? Oh, wow. I don't, there's very rarely a day that I don't, I'm not blessed. I say, I was going to say that I don't see that, but it's such a blessing to see that. Right. Um, even last night I drove uh, two and a half hours South and spoke at a, at a real estate meetup group. It's a women's meetup group. And, um, in that process, I share that vulnerability, that realness, you know, I actually, I don't always share about my early beginnings in some of the heartache and the struggle. However, what came of that is that now in this room of women, I can say, this is my experience. Mm. And I faced abuse and I faced these situations head on in, in a room like this, I know that there's somebody else in here statistically that this is going to resonate with. And when you can say that from a point of he healing, right? We speak from mm -hmm. our scars, not from our bleeding wounds. It's a very powerful opportunity. And it doesn't have to be something that dramatic. Like even just knowing that the investors that I serve, every single one of them, they have a story. They have a reason why they want to invest. And most of them have um, so such cool concepts. So for example, I in my small North Idaho area, I was introduced to, um, to a couple and they need to 1031 something. And it, it's a sizable amount. And it was, and, and we share faith and we'd met a month and a half ago. We reconnected recently. And now here I am connecting them mm -hmm. with, okay, wait, you have a deadline. We got to get these, I, these properties identified. And lo and behold, in one of the conversations today of a potential place we can, you know, they can park this, you know, 1031 into, here's another investor who shares faith and they are like completely synergetic. And it's, it might even include, you know, buying some land off of a church. No joke. Wow. <laughs> so like, but their, their hearts to serve it's, and honestly, that's the first time it's come full circle like that in that capacity, but that just happened, you know, a few hours ago. And it, it's, it's amazing when you see, oh, I can connect this person with that person and mm. what is going to materialize of it. I don't see, this is where it is. We want to be obsessed that we're in control of the outcome. <laughs> and if we do everything right, going back to checklist Christian, or if you don't share faith, you can just say, I'm living a checklist life. And that's not living at all. Yeah. You know, the outcome is not always contingent and dependent upon us. There are so many factors that we cannot even see and reconcile that are at play. And so to be able to just trust the process and say, all right, I'm not in charge of the outcome. This is my goal. This is where the ship is headed. 
And I'm going to course correct along the way as necessary or until I get better guidance as to that's the wrong island to go out to, that's where I'm going to head. Yeah. And so it's yeah. it's really cool to watch that whole process play out. Julie, um, we're all in the same circles in real estate syndications and et cetera. But what you're saying is somewhat of the antithesis of what you hear. I can do this. I'm going to do that. I'm... Uh, if I just do this, 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 and this, if I just do that, then I will make it. I'm there. Look at this and et cetera. Um, I see it all the time, all the time. And, uh, uh, it bothers me that I hear this and see this and, and where Christ and, and God are not part of the process or the walk. It's all about me mm -hmm. it's all about me mm -hmm. uh it it bothers me so that's actually how um that's that's been where the conscious investor has headed so i talk about faith openly on my podcast um it's not the central central element of it, but it's something that my listeners, you can't listen and not know that yeah. is important to my life. <laughs> um, and so what's interesting is that the conscious investor is all about that because so many people are bankrupting the best parts of their life, right? So they're chasing. And, and so here's my moment in my soapbox is that I kept seeing people chasing after financial freedom and it's like, oh, I'm going to get financial freedom. Ooh, I'm going to leave my W-2 and I'm going to be a full-time real estate investor. And I'm always like, <laughs> you realize you are still going to have a job. Like, I know that <laughs> that seems glamorous to you, but you're trading a job and you might not even have the shoulders to shoulder the stresses. Like, have you ever been an owner of a company? Have you ever been in in the C-suite? Is that like, or have you been in lower middle management and you're like, no, I can run the show. Like, come on people. Sorry. That is a soapbox <laughs> for me. People chasing after something that they think is going to be better. And they think that it's going to improve their life. And meanwhile, they're completely oblivious to what I call health mindset wealth, right? Okay. The health of our, our physical being, our health of our relationships, our spiritual health, like do the health check. Do the mindset check. Like, are you being the guardian of the mind? Are you being the gatekeeper? Because it's our job to do that. Mm -hmm. And when we think about wealth, we have to totally redirect and say, what is wealth really? Wealth is not all the tangible that we see. Like, great, you have so many units. Good for you. I don't care. People ask me, like, how many <laughs> units do you have? I'm like, I don't know. A handful. <laughs> I'm like, I guess that's a bad answer. I guess I really should know what that number is exactly, but I don't know. It's about this. Like, it really doesn't matter to me, <laughs> and so, which, which is funny because in that I, I I've like pushed back on that culture quite a bit because I'm like, those things don't matter. What matters is what's the performance of everything is everything performing. Am I showing up the way I should yeah. is, you know, is everything being done based out of integrity and congruence and character, or is it just done out of greed and, you know, shortcuts and such. Um, but when we're looking at our wealth, that third element of conscious investor is, is we have our tangible wealth, which is what most people think of as wealth. Oh, I could touch it. I can see it. Yay. Good for me. We have intangible wealth, which is where all of our cute little millennials and our, you know, <laughs> uh, Gen Z and everything, they're into the experiences, by the way, I love experiences, but they're into their experiences. Okay. Well, guess what? Your experiences die with you. Yay for you. That's no different than building up a whole bunch of tangible wealth. You mm -hmm. building up experiences is just the flip side of the exact same coin. Mm -hmm. So yay for you. What are you doing with it? <laughs> and that's why true wealth is when we have transferable wealth, right? When I have wealth that is embodied in me and I take time to come and share that with someone, to mentor somebody, to pour into somebody, now I've transferred my experiences, my expertise, all of it. Now I've transferred it over. So quite frankly, I really don't care about legacy wealth. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've actually recently kind of like, kind of pushed back on that because I'm writing a book. And in that book, when, I, as I came across, like I was contextualizing what wealth really is. And I'm like, transferable wealth is not the same thing as legacy wealth. 
I mean, yes, I want to pass things down to my kids and grandkids. Don't get me wrong, but I want it to be so much bigger than that. I want to transfer to the world. I want to transfer to as many people as possible, almost like freeze tag, where when we're kids and you play freeze tag, you touch <laughs> the person who's it, they touch them. Every That person has to freeze until somebody that's unfrozen comes and touches them. I want to go in this world of what I think are too many frozen people. I want to transfer wealth. I want to transfer knowledge and expertise, and I want to go and touch and unfreeze as many people mm, as humanly possible. Good. And for me, that is very much faith related, right? It's anchored in faith. Like, can I transfer this amazing faith and, and story that God's written and woven in my life over the years? Can I share that with you and, and help you see God working in your life? Yeah. I, okay, we're running at, we're coming up on our time, end of our time. I have one more question because I know we'll probably go for about 10 more minutes on it. Uh, but then we'll go into a speed <laughs> round because I've got so many. You're like, come on, Julie. No, you just, I told you guys, you might have so to tell many, me to be quiet. I've got I've... so many directions we could go and so many, we're going to have to do part two of this podcast episode. <laughs> um, okay. You seem to have no problem sharing your faith as part of your business and as far as your everyday life. Um, how did you get there and how do you recommend somebody, who, another business person, male or female who struggles with, uh, that line between where faith and business meet, how do you recommend merging the two for, for somebody who wants to? It's such a part of how every, it's part of everything in my life. It is the framework in which I see all of the world, right? It's a context, it's everything. And whether we have faith in Christ, we have in whatever our background in, in um, like spirituality and religion is, because there are so many people that have a variety of backgrounds, like we have to recognize that that is creating this filter in our lives. Whether we can see it or not, there is a filter in our lives. I was working with a coaching client a couple of days ago, and that client was raised with a particular faith um, different than mine. And actually this has happened multiple times and it scarred them. It wounded them. It hurt them. And, and that is affecting them today in their businesses because they're still contextualizing off of the wounds that they had. It doesn't even relate to business. We would think that there's no connection or correlation. So this is very similar to um, what I call mindset and mechanics. Mm. There's a lot of free information in the world on anything you want to learn. So with real estate investing, we listen to podcasts, we read books, we go to e events cost money, but we, you know, YouTube, <laughs> we have all these free access to free resources. We can get the mechanics, but not everybody's, I, I still don't have my private jet. Okay. I'm, not there yet. <laughs> I'm just saying if it were that easy, then we would all have our own private jets and our islands and blah, blah, blah. So the same is true uh, with spirituality, with like my faith in particular, right? It's you're living life, but there is something else in your life and you've, you're filtering it. And so just like we have mindset and mechanics, well, guess what? My faith is, is the lens in which I'm viewing everything and it is influencing and directly impacting everything that I do. Mm -hmm. If I'm not talking about it, then I'm doing everyone a disservice because if that's not going to jive with somebody then it's better that we know up front and so if you are hesitant about talking about your faith so i don't go around necessarily proselytizing everybody <laughs> saying like the end of the day is near come to jesus you know like i'm not you don't have cigarette I, boards on your back or in front walking around <laughs> I, I don't, I can tell you stories because of the type of small town I live in. I can tell you stories <laughs> and, and, and I don't have to do that. I'm, I'm not caught. That's not my mission. That's not my lane. Mm -hmm. That's not what God wants to do with me, but God wants me to live my life in a way that reflects him. And so I really deeply believe that if we can say, well, if my faith is important to me and if other people can be talking about their spirituality, which is very, very trendy right now. Like people are deeply, deeply spiritual these days. And if everyone else can talk about their, how they are, you know, um, meditating and how they're having certain practices that are actual spiritual practices, what is the difference between them talking about that 
and me talking about it. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I have the truth. I have the truth. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have the, I have like access to like legit, real cool freedom here. You know, like everybody can have it. It's free. You know, so I'm just saying, I don't want to, you know, just like as a child, you know, I don't want to hide my light. You know, yeah. I want to make sure that it shines bright and I'm not going to snuff it out and dim it down for other people. And I'm also not rude about it. I am very much aware that not everyone shares my same beliefs. And I don't, I can be very respectful of everyone else's beliefs. And because I am respectful of other people's beliefs and I can allow them space to have their own, like whatever it is that they believe, then I get that also. Like treat others the way you wanna be treated. Well, I'm gonna treat them the exact same way I wanna be treated. So if I think that if we go in that context of gentleness and kindness and authenticity, and there are times where it might not be appropriate to be overt about your faith. Like I don't walk into, uh, you know, one of my GP meetings being like, holy Jesus, divine, you know, like, but guess what? My, my partners know that faith is important and central in my life. So I think it's, it's more powerful to just live gently and yeah. live authentically than it is to feel like, well, if I'm going to talk about my faith, I got to go and like, I got to go be that preacher type person. I'm like, mm, mm -hmm. no, that's definitely not me. That's so everybody's good. got different talents. Yeah. Yeah. Perfectly well put live gently um, and live authentically. That's a, that's a great way to, to put it and end it. Um, all right. I want to head into to our speed round fast questions, fast answers. It's a great way for people to get to know you just a little bit better. I promised we'd come back to the book question offline. We had, we'd asked, uh, about books. We were talking about it. So we just decided to jump in. So I'll start by asking the first question, which is which book has had the greatest impact to you in the recent, recent history it could be the past year, past 10 years, whatever you choose. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I used to run a book club and I'm a voracious reader. So if you're listening and you're not a reader, don't worry. I was a, a school teacher who taught kids how to read. And I've only been a reader for like six years. So <laughs> like, time. I'm just catching, I'm catching up on lost time. Um, I have a stack of books always beside me. This one stood out to me so much. So I listened to it on an audiobook. I'm holding it up. If you're, yeah. if you're watching this, it's hero on a mission by Donald Miller. Um, this book really stood out for me. It's uh, a path to a meaningful life. I listened to the audiobook, um, which if you tell me that you're not a reader, but you listen to audiobooks, I just want you to keep in mind that's good. You're going to get about 20% of the information ingested into you. The content at 20% that I actually internalized was so good. <laughs> I had to buy it, read it. <laughs> and I want to apply these practices into my life. And he really takes you, I wrote out my eulogy. Um, because that's part of the practice. Yeah. So I, I actually really enjoyed that crossover between stoicism and um, Donald Miller is also a person of faith. Yeah. But that that concept of living with death in mind, like we were given a death sentence the moment we were born. That's not morbid. That's mm -hmm. not negative. It, mm -hmm. it just is. And so how are we going to use the heartbeats that we've been entrusted with? And I say entrusted with like do something with it. You're a great, tremendous investment by God. Like God invested in you. He gave you heartbeats. So go make the best use yeah. of them. What's one piece of real estate advice that you give to others? Oh gosh, so many things that I would give to others. What's <laughs> like, the best one? Don't worry. The, I think the best one is stop looking around at everyone else and do what you're supposed to do. Right. So don't try to keep up with the people around you because you'll make bad decisions a lot of times and you'll rush into a deal that is probably not the very best deal. So like know who you are, know what you're about. And however long or short, there is no time metric to this. Just walk the path that unfolds before you. That's good. What in what situations do you find that you're most happy or fulfilled? Anytime that I have an opportunity to pour into people and to support people mm. and to be engaged in, in meaningful conversation where it's truly co-creating, speaking of that again, right? But you're creating like this shared pool of meaning, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, 
that's from crucial conversations another phenomenal book right but i love it i love that's when i feel most alive and and fulfilled is when everybody's just like creating all this meaning to expand our understanding of things yeah. all right and last but not least uh, as you head west and we've talked about this is uh proverbial you start in one place end up in another uh, you learn a lot along the way, ups and downs and uh, flat tires. But as you head west in life, <laughs> where do you hope to end up? What does this look like? Not geographically per se, but just what does life right. look like? Yeah, well, considering I wrote my eulogy recently, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I can actually tell it, yeah. you where I wanted to end <laughs> I have, I have. And you know, what's really cool about that is I realized that my husband and I can be married for like 70, 75 years, you know, if we both live together and to a ripe age, like, dang, that's, that's awesome. really cool to like create life together. Um, but ultimately I, like my vision that God has given me over the last several years is I want to create a place actually Donald Miller and his wife, Elizabeth have already have done this. I learned through listening to this book and that is they have their own house. Yeah. Um, and then they have a guest house and people come and they, they have space for people to come and expand and grow. And that's ultimately what I want to do. I ultimately, in, I love real estate investing and that is like a ginormous passion of mine. I love investing in humans. Yeah. And so I'm excited about that opportunity when God presents it. I don't know how. So that's my like, I don't know how, but yeah. that's on my heart. So <laughs> <laughs> I too have seen Donald Miller's house and I want it as well. <laughs> Everything about that house he just built is incredible. Um, well, Julie, we're so thankful that you joined us on the podcast today. I, I, I was being facetious, but I actually do mean it. We should have a part two uh, in the next couple of months. <laughs> But uh, where can people find you if they want to listen to your podcast, if they want to look you up, where can they find you? Yeah, you can f listen to or watch the Conscious Investor podcast anywhere, wherever you're listening to this right now. I'd be honored if you, if it, this resonates with you at all, you'll enjoy the conversations, Mindset Mondays, um, interviews on Thursdays, and I'm getting ready to add the third episode. So stay tuned. It will be specifically tailored towards path of investors and just, you know, girding up five, 10 minute episodes on just, you know, this is something that you need to be aware of. Um, just those mechanics that all passive investors need to know. And I would love it if you checked out, um, you can go to the conscious and, oh no, it's, I am a conscious investor.com. Uh, <laughs> I put I the, the conscious investor was not available. It's a new website <laughs> that is for the conscious investor. You can access the investing. You can access my coaching. You can access my speech, my speaking, my speech. Yeah, right. Good, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you can you can listen to the podcast there as well. It's an affirmation and conscious is challenging to spell. But if you type it out in a sentence, it's much easier. So yeah. just go to. I am a conscious investor.com and um, you'll have access to the whole amazing world of the conscious investor. And, and we'll link everything in the show notes so everybody can find you as well. But um, thanks to everybody for tuning in to another episode of Heading West. Tune in next time. And uh, Julie, thanks again for joining us. Yeah, this thanks, was a Julie. lot of fun. Thanks, guys.